All right, wonderful. So I am turning on broadcasting here and we'll let folks go ahead and trickle in. Um, so before you move back to uh, Denver, where was where were you in um, in Manhattan? So I really, I did not want to be right in the city. Um, mm. So we had an apartment uh, in Hoboken um, on the Hudson River. Um, it oh, was okay. Much nicer to, you know, take that you know, 15 minute train ride and get the view of the skyline as opposed to always being in the city. And my dog also greatly appreciates that that's what we did too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think actually, so one of our attendees, I think uh, Dan Grossberg from Clyde is, uh, I think he actually might live in either Hoboken or Jer Jersey City, so I'm not 100% sure. Oh, he just, yeah, he just wrote Jersey Rules, so yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so the, um, oh, but I imagine your dog is much happier being back in Denver, huh? Yeah, yeah, she is. She, she was okay. We lived across the street from a nice little park and everything, but she, she definitely prefers her doggy door and coming in and out as, as she pleases. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, and I'm sure that there's like, you know, getting out and like being able to run around in the, uh, you know, does she go, does she go running with you? No, no, uh, she used to. She's, she's going to be 12, so. Oh. Not, 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 not really her, not really her thing. <laughs> likes napping napping in the sun and playing some fetch <laughs> <laughs> awesome um wonderful well i think we can uh go ahead and get started here so uh thanks everybody for for joining for sales strategy office hours really excited to have marilyn here with us to tackle a bunch of um bunch of fun questions um a little bit more about marilyn here who is joining us from from denver um in a second here but, um, but Sales Strategy Office Hours is a modern sales um, uh, production. The, really where it comes from is that uh, frequently in the past, I would end up doing Q&A sessions with sales leaders or investors or founders or what have you uh, in order to kind of like get into their hardest problems. And one of the things that I realized is that it, potentially what we could do is do this publicly with people who have expertise beyond, beyond my capacity and and then other people who have those same problems could hear the answers <laughs> and uh and 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 thereby um get better at what they do and so now now we do these weekly it's really fun usually tackle between five to eight questions across a uh across the hour with um with somebody who's uh experienced an expert like uh like marilyn here so marilyn you want to uh, go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody Sure, and uh, first, thank you very much for uh, inviting me this week. I'm excited to be here. Um, so Marilyn Ballas, I'm currently a VP of sales at a company called Impact. Uh, Impact is a SaaS platform that helps all different types of companies manage all their different types of partnerships from tracking to contracting, uh, analytics, and also recruitment. Uh, before Impact, I worked at Epsilon. Um, I was also in sales there. I was in their data division. Um, prior to being in sales at Epsilon, I was on the, the stats team there. So I actually, you know, helped build um, products and write statistical code uh, that would help uh, the data division and sales mine certain data uh, to sell um, to all of the, the different clients that we had at Epsilon. So I have a background in analytics and made a transition um, into sales. Yeah, we're going to get into that more because I find that that's a atypical background, but but something that's like more and more common, uh, more and more common nowadays. Uh, so so a little bit about me for folks that don't don't know me. My name is Pete Kazanji. I'm one of the founders of um, Atrium. We make sales performance analysis software. I also started Modern Sales, which is the nations, maybe the world's largest um, sales, leadership, operations, uh, enablement, uh, peer education group. Um, prior to this, uh, my background is, is also not in sales. <laughs> um, I was a product marketer, product manager way back in the day at VMware before I started my first um, software company called Talentbin, which was a recruiting software company where I had to go from being a business generalist founder to a seller to a sales manager 
um, kind of figure things out the, the hard, way, hard way there. Eventually that was acquired by Monster Worldwide in 2014, after which I went and wrote a, a book on early stage startup sales called, called Founding Sales. So that's a little bit on, on me there. Uh, for, for folks who are joining us for the first time, really the process here is we have folks who um, ask questions ahead of time. I have some questions that, um, that I think would be particularly great for, to get Marilyn to weigh in on, but also folks um, who are joining us in the audience, go ahead and drop your questions um, in, the, in the chat room there. And what we'll do is we'll go ahead and grab people and then promote them up to join us. Um, we'll tackle the question, then move on to the next one. We usually do about five to five to eight minutes on on each question. So that's that's how that goes. So um, I think I have all of my little check boxes off here on Asana. Um, we'll see. We'll kind of get into our our first question here. So actually, I think the first question that I'd love to get your take on is, as you were noting, you have a background in statistics and analytics and and what have you, which is you know, not the most common um, sales leadership background or sales management background, um, and and so you you got to have those muscles already um, of, for data driven data driven management. What for people who don't have that don't have that background? Um, what's the like? What's a great way to to both a acquire it? and get better at it and then b given the fact that you're like you have this capacity oftentimes sales operations has this capacity but they work with people who don't necessarily um aren't as facile at that what are some great ways of like helping people to like you know to bring people along in that regard yeah no it's a it's a really great great question and you know i think a lot of it also stems from certain assumptions um, regarding uh -huh. people and people that have a statistical background. Okay. So for example, uh, I avoided math, like, like the plague. <laughs> High school, undergrad, I, I really only got into statistics um, in graduate school. Um, okay. I, had to in a, I was in a quantitative research program and i um, just dove into statistics and, you know, Back in the day, you know, algebra didn't make much sense to me, you know, like why, how long it takes Jerry in a rowboat to get somewhere really had no <laughs> meaning and didn't interest me. And um, I didn't really want to learn about it. Um, but sure. statistics, to me, makes sense. So mm -hmm. statistics and these kinds of, of metrics actually tell stories and mean something else. So mm -hmm. Um, my, my point is, I think some people get very intimidated um, in thinking about trying to dive into analytics and looking at data and playing with data to see, you know, answer questions that they have. Um, so number one, I think you need to just not be intimidated and, and, and right. scared. Um, and then secondly, you know, if, if you're in sales leadership and uh, you, you, most companies do have some form of a RevOps team or analyst mm. and would say, you, you know, and go talk with them, you know, say, you know, what are the tools that at our company we have access to? What's the, the data that's out there? Um, because for most of us in sales, you know, we understand that we've got leading indicators and lagging indi indicators and, right. you know, being able to track and manage those metrics, um, is, is, is really important. So, I mean, I think number one, don't be scared of it. Um, right. it it's actually much easier and much more logical than, than I think most people think it is. And secondly, to, to recognize the resources around you because nothing's more powerful, especially in this day and age, as access to data and having just a few tools to be able to look at the pieces of information that are important to you, your team and your company. It's very empowering for you to show up to a meeting because <laughs> you ran that report or you went right. ahead and analyzed something, even if it was just, you know, 15, 20 minutes to get a few data points, as opposed to sitting there waiting for the analyst to tell you. Right. So. What, um, yeah, for sure. I think one of the things that I've found that ends up being really important is connecting it to 
like why this matters, um, which I think is kind of like the, the story yeah. piece of it is because, you know, there's people who are, and it sounds like this is actually maybe, maybe your case. There's people who are more potentially like left brain where like the num like the numbers are the kind of the point versus what is the actual, like what's going on? What is the actual story, which is then supported by, by these numbers. And I think in sales, we're kind of more of the, the latter, like we have a goal, it's bookings, it's wins, et cetera. And then the numbers potentially, you know, undergird that. And so, you know, connecting it to why it matters is I think really, really an important thing. So it's rather than just being like, hey, you have a bunch of like stuck opportunities here, a bunch of untouched opportunities. Yeah, okay, well, why does that matter? Well, it turns out that opportunities that are stuck and are not progressing have a tendency to not close. And if they, those don't close, well, you're gonna either, you know, those are not gonna resolve in bookings and you're gonna have to have, you know, more pipeline generation, et cetera. Oh, got it, okay, cool. So I think one, that, and then the second thing that can oftentimes be hard for people who are more, um, who are not super used to uh, consuming, consuming data is what it, like connecting a next action to it. Oh, you have a low volume of, you know, uh, new pipe creation mm -hmm. on this team or for this rep or, or what have you. As a result, the thing we we should actually spend our time spend spend time doing is some more prospecting, or you have a low mix of expansion opportunities in your in your pipe. Have you considered going and prospecting in your you know to your your prior closed one customers? Because I think sometimes the linkage can be can be broken there, and people are like, oh man, what yeah. like what what do I what do I do next there? Yeah, I do think yeah. The third thing is potential for analysis paralysis so right it's it's around you might find something interesting but not actionable and so sure. also right spending your time you know trying to understand what are those those pieces that will drive action and dra and drive decision making um, for you and your team like like the things that you're saying the why is this important it's because we take this action um, so it, it can be tough to sort of weed through it all uh, as well. Yeah. Uh, so uh, moving on to another another question here, um, Jonathan from um, John Soroka uh, submitted a question ahead of time. Um, his question was on, you know, what are the key what are the key challenges and opportunities associated with selling into like a new disruptive new disruptive space um that kind of comes from that is l less um that is like uh that has had historically less innovation in it um i think impact very is is kind of part and parcel of this like what are the what have been the biggest issues there and and you know how how are good ways to attack that yeah, no, that, that's a, that is a really great question. Uh, and you're right, impact does fall in, into that category um, of being a, a disruptor. Where, you know, we work in, in the, the field of partnerships, and one type of partnership is uh, affiliates, the traditional mm -hmm. affiliate world. And we have a, a ton of, of clients um, where they manage their affiliate program on impact. Uh, but historically, you know, the affiliate networks have been around since about mid to late 90s. And when we came on the scene, our, our model is a little bit different. So there's obvious benefit to being a, a, a disruptor. Um, but to your point, some of the challenges, uh, I would say, is just the one fact that you're different. Mm -hmm. So as we know just human nature and human psychology. When something's different, you tend to be skeptical, a little weary about it like maybe you don't want to be the first to try it you're trying to see if other people are going to try out this new model or this new thing um, so i think number one um, making sure that your messaging is clear uh, whether it's marketing on your website uh, arming your sdrs bdrs and aes with um, the talk tracks and the information that make it make it easy 
for other people to understand uh, the differences and more importantly, the value of those differences, right? So right. when you do enter a space and you're, you're different, you chose to be different for a reason. You're not just right. choosing to be different to be different. It's because there's a benefit or a value to that difference. And so being sure that you can truly articulate um, those, those, val those value propositions that your differences you know, really provide and to make it less intimidating uh, to try something new. And then of course, case studies and references when right. you're new to this is, is huge. We all know in any space, there is the, that group of early adopters that are really excited, raising their hand to try the newest and best thing. Well, early on, right, you have to make sure A, that you're servicing them appropriately and to right. make sure that they're your advocates out there talking about you. What, um, like, what, what was that contrast for um, impact as compared to the like how did that work its way out in in impact like what was the what was the specific contrast against the the incumbents and then like how did you guys nail that home just like as a case study of that of what you're just describing yeah i would say probably there are um, two major things um the the first one uh, would be our pricing model um, mm -hmm. so uh, we uh, are a SaaS based model uh, mm -hmm. historically networks are like a monthly variable rate um, where we have like a 12 month commitment, you commit to a volume and here's your flat fee. So just the pricing structure is different. Where mm -hmm. obviously if one of your main differences is pricing structure, uh, everyone's sensitive about budget and, and price. Uh, right. So that was definitely something that we had to talk about, but um, there's benefits to the SaaS side. So that's really what we focused on was that value and mm -hmm. at the long-term 12 month value that we would drive for them and what that looked like on their bottom line. Um, I would say something else um, that really, that was very different for us is uh, services. Uh, so right. a lot of, um, we did not have like a dedicated, fully managed uh, services arm where mm -hmm would do everything um, potentially for, the, for the, the prospect or the customer. Um, mm -hmm. And some of our competition um, is what they would, they, they would offer that. Like, hey, we'll do it all, we'll hit every button, you know, we'll do, we'll do everything, we'll take it over. Um, so I'd say those are probably the, the two major, major differences between us and, and yeah. uh, our competitors. Yeah, I think, so we're kind of in a similar situation with, with Atrium, and I guess that was the case. Largely, this is the case with a lot of early stage um, uh, technology companies because usually they're trying to exploit some sort of deficit in the existing uh, in existing market. So I think one thing that's really important to make sure that you're hammering home with folks is um, like what changed to potentially enable this this new thing, um, because otherwise, like getting them to snap out of kind of the existing way of doing things is uh, can, can oftentimes be, can be challenging. So like to use Atrium as an example, um, so Atrium does sales performance analysis software um, and that is, that much of which is automated. And so there's a couple of things that like were key enablers there. So, you know, um, the fact that email systems and calendar systems and phone systems and what have you, uh, CRM systems now have APIs, whereas like eh, 10 years ago, they, may, they maybe didn't. Um, that makes it such that it can be extraordinarily easy to just like quickly turn on data and then have quick insights um, in, in short order. And so that's, that's something that historically was not available. And so it, it's important to, when you show up to folks, be like, hey, by the way, I, you know, if, you're mo if you're like a lot of people that we talk to, um, you probably have, a, have difficulty getting you know, uh, rep performance information into the CRM in a way that you can be interrogated, like, you know, getting meeting data in there or calling data or, or email data or, or what have you. Um, don't worry that something has changed. And so that essentially allows them to revisit their priors mm -hmm. because, you know, <laughs> you know, how people are, they're like, well, this decision was made this way in the past, or we've always done it this way. So like, you know, giving people permission to re revisit their priors can be really important there. I think the other thing that can end up being really important is to like, and then frame against those, those kind of prior 
ways of, of being in the world. Um, because this is something that I tell my reps all the time is, is that there's all this baggage associated with how things have typically been done. I imagine this was the case in, um, in kind of like affiliates and, and partners as well. And so if you don't like proactively, it's almost like proactive objection handling. Um, if you don't get ahead of that, then, then essentially those, like those assumptions can be used against you. So like in Atrium's case, oftentimes when we're showing people Atrium or we're talking about it or we're giving a demo or what have you, people are automatically thinking like, oh my God, it's gonna take so much time and effort to get this information into Atrium such that you can, you, you can do these crazy things that, that this. If reps don't proactively frame against that, Mm -hmm. like you could essentially go totally sideways or someone can get set in their opinion and be like, well, this is never going to work because like, you know, I can't get that data capture or, oh man, I don't have the personal bandwidth in order to set this up. So I think an important thing is understanding what the existing like biases might be. So you can be proactive against, um, against, uh, you know, combating those proactively. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I would, I would, I would, I would agree with that for sure. Yeah. Um, cool. So, uh, another question that we had um, that came in. So you were talking about um, the notion of pro, uh, uh, early adopters, mm -hmm. right? Um, because you've been at Impact five years or so? Uh, yeah, say? six, uh, I think next month. Right, so the organization has scaled substantially during that time and so now, I think I feel that the organization, the sales organization is like 50 plus, 60, 60 plus or, or mm -hmm. what have you. Yeah. yeah. So, so now given the fact how, how large the organization is, you're probably not, you're not just selling to those early adopters anymore. What changes as you have to get into those, like that late majority and the people who aren't necessarily like open to, to change? Yeah, no, it's super interesting. So yeah, in, in the, in the beginning, I would say you have to start, people don't know who you are. <laughs> yep. So how you present your, your company and, and, you know, all part of your presentation flow is around, you know, this is who we are. This is why we exist. <laughs> and then here's how we like legitimize, you know, ourselves yeah. in the space to where you should be talking to us. Right. And, and right, the here's here's how we're different, and and the benefits that that we bring to you. So then, as that starts to happen, one of the main things that changes is 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 people know who you are. Sure. Right. So you don't have to go through that whole song and dance. They're like, yeah, I see that you are um, one of the major players in this space. You've been growing rapidly. Um, at this point, some people are either just curious because they see, you know. The, these four competitors of mine just moved to you guys. Like, I have to see what you're doing. Like, why did they move? Mm -hmm. um, which is exciting because that's, that's a piece that, you know, you don't, your reps don't have to have to cover anymore, which is just legitimizing yourself within your, your space. Um, the other thing that brings though is, you know, they, you might need to correct what they heard about you. They also mm. show up, I think, with assumptions. So one of the, one of the things that we just can't get too complacent about is us assuming that because they show up and they're familiar with us, that we also skip out on some of the, the important fun, like fundamental points that, yes. that we need to bring up. So as, as we have to make sure that our, our sales teams are also not making assumptions as well um, because they're showing up with some idea as opposed to earlier where we know they didn't know who we are. <laughs> right, that's like a such, that's such a hard balance to strike though, right? Because you have some people who show up and they, they do know a lot about impact, let's say. And so then if you then say, all right, we're gonna drag you through like the history okay. lesson here, yeah. then, then they're, they, you might have a situation where someone's like, oh my God, all right, I'm gonna like do email in, and instead like how, yeah, how do you strike, like, how do you get a rep to strike that balance? Right, so it's all about that, that discovery and making sure that your reps are, are not a one size fits all and remind them that, you know, they are, they are talking to other human beings that have experiences and knowledge and that, you know, each, those phone calls, 
are about the prospect. Um, it's also not about us, you know, talking with the, like at them um, and just giving them information about us. It, it's really, you know, starting out, you know, with the basics, those open-ended questions, um, those high-level questions, and just being honest. Um, I've got many of my reps just say, you know, hey, have you have you heard of Impact? And they're like, yeah, I have. Great. Like, um, what do you know about us? I want to make sure. sure that you know I'm not I'm not redundant. So. Uh, you know, and, and why did you take this call today? What are you looking to learn on this call? You know, those kinds of things so that they can figure out where on the spectrum, you know, they should put this person um, so that they don't waste their time for them and, you know, et cetera. Right. It's like, I don't want to be redundant. So I would like you to reveal to me what you don't know so I can make sure that you don't make problematic assumptions. Right, but I'm doing it in the service, doing it in your, your service. Yeah, I think like we're in this weird situation right now where like, you know, Atrium has like just, we're just like broaching like a hundred customers or what have you. So like, obviously we're like I don't know, four years behind impact or, you know, five years behind impact or whatever. And so we're very much transitioning from, I wouldn't say we're like transitioning. We're, we're only now just being able to like sell on reputation. <laughs> Whereas previously you would show up and it all had to be on like functionality and like new innovation where it's like, yeah, cool. Tableau sucks. Right. Yeah. Because like, it's important, it's like impossible for you to use and no one pays attention to, oh yeah, totally. Right. Whereas now we have enough, you know, customer logos and success and renewals and, and referenceability and it feels super weird to, so for, as an example, all of like our historical slide presentation, that was like the framing before we would like get in a product or whatever was all about like problem, you know, solution, use cases and technology. Where, and at a certain point, what we, what we realized is that we had sufficient kind of like logos to like pull that up to the front of the presentation mm -hmm. and at least get some juice from that, if, if wow. you will, yeah. um, which, which, which was super weird to, to do that. But um, I think actually, yeah, uh, and I think we actually ended up selling, or at least a, a, a like a second level, um, you know, uh, SVP of sales or VP of sales or what have you. Never got into the product whatsoever, and so of course the like this was wildly confusing to our to our reps. Some of the other stakeholders, like you know, operations and sales management, had been in it, but the, the SVP of sales like kind of didn't care. He was like, look, look I just want to like index off of other. Like who are the other people who are who are purchased who have purchased from you in the past and and are referenceable and what have you and that was like really weird for us um, and so that like but I think it's an, an important thing to like not miss out on using that because you you potentially can just get lost in the like the features and what have you and and miss out on using that like that reputational value. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. You brought up uh, the like the sales template um, that that they use. I would say over the last five years, probably every six to seven months, we've updated our deck for that very reason. Because at some point at that stage, you, you realize, oh, like I, I don't have to do these two or three slides anymore, right? Like right. people know who we are. So kind of switching that around and staying on top of it, yeah, is very important. But how do you do that? Like, you just calendar it? <laughs> like, hey, it's been six months, we should... We should refresh, we should refresh our deck or is it just kind of based on, you know, rep feedback or what? You know, it is, it is based on uh, rep feedback or any changes that, that we're coming out with. I mean, also at Impact, we're doing uh, new releases every like four weeks um, within our, our software. So we always have something new to talk about. So we are also always kind of scanning, scanning it and adding new things, um, adding new case studies, um, new stats and things. Um, and then also looking at the slides that are used most, right? Mm -hmm. So you have, you know, like most companies, we've got a, an inventory of a bunch of slides and, yep. you know, AEs they can choose and, you know, which ones they want to use based on use case and, and what's important. Uh, to the prospect. And so also seeing what's actually getting used uh, is important too. Yeah. So um, th on the feature thing, this is something that I really, I wanted to ask you about because you guys, you guys had an acquisition recently. Is that right? Correct. Yep. 
Who, who was that or what do they do? We just acquired Activate. Um, it oh. is a, it's a wonderful, we're super excited about it. It is one of the best influencer platforms out there. Um, okay. It just happened about three weeks ago. Uh, so we're just starting to fold them in uh, to the impact organization. Okay, so, and I think you and I were talking about this a little bit before we hopped on. So if you have a lot of innovation that's happening, whether it's like acquisition or shipping new things, what's the mechanism by which to fold that into? Like make sure you're continuously folding that into the, the relevant talk tracks and the collateral and then making sure that the reps are actually doing that because like the more dynamic the product is, it's not like just one and done training because now you gotta do Delta updates with the, with the reps. Like yeah. how, do you, how do you guys do that? So, I mean, it's a, it's a process. I mean, I would say overall with, with any acquisition, I would say most people would say regardless of the prep that you do before the acquisition happens, as soon as it does happen, you realize all of the stuff you have left to do. Um, and having a really solid go-to-market plan and product plan. So obviously, you know, when you, when you make this acquisition, um, you have a vision, right, of, of how it's going to fit in. Um, so I think there's a few things you have to think about, which is, you know, number one, do you leave it standalone at all as its own thing for right now? And I think the answer to that depends on how different it is and the problems that it solves, right? Mm -hmm. What's the complement of it, um, as opposed to potentially like, rolling it all in, right? So you've seen some companies uh, acquire companies and they kind of get rid of that brand and just roll it in, into theirs. And, um, right, these are all viable options. And I think with acquisitions, it's like, you know, that company and the go-to-market team needs to decide what's best. So specifically for uh, AEs and the sales team, depending on how you're just overall approaching that acquisition, depends on who you train on what. Right? right. So everyone is not necessarily going to be trained on like all of the activate people might not know every single thing about the partnership cloud, um, right. you know, within 60 days and, and vice versa. Um, so, I mean, what, what I would say is you need, especially after an acquisition, salespeople get, get very excited for the shiny <laughs> object. <laughs> right. new, this is new and which is great. And it is super exciting. Um, but it's also coming up with a plan, being transparent and communicating what that plan is so that your teams know, is the vision that I'm going to be able to sell it? And when will I be able to sell it? And how are you going to equip me to sell it? Um, right. I think sometimes when it gets too wild, wild west, you end up in a spot that you really don't want to be in. So you have to have that forethought of where you want to be. And those first steps that you take in the first three to four months of that acquisition um, are, are super important to being where you want to be with that acquisition 12 to 18 months away. Yeah. I think um, one of the things that, that, so my background is, that, is in product marketing from a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And so I have an appreciation for, you know, the, the proper collateralization of any new, any new product. And I think one of the things that organizations will do is they'll like product management will ship something new and um and it's kind of like an afterthought as to like the collateral like cool what are the like what's the story around this what what are the actual slides what are the screenshots that are required what is the you know what's the 50 word description what's the 100 word description of this and so just making sure that it's someone's job to do that like and and they, like cool this shipped was this incremental checkbox done um, as well? I think that's something that ends up being really important and can kind of oftentimes be overlooked. And it doesn't have to be super complicated. It doesn't have to be like, all right, here are the, like the 15 assets, but just like maybe there's just one asset or two assets and there's the minimum viable version of that. And then the second thing is, is just making sure that there is a, a consumption cadence. So I'm a big like operating rhythm person. Mm -hmm. And so as an example, you know, we have our Monday morning sales team meeting because I only have four reps, soon to be seven. And so there's a section in our, in our team meeting, which is new product and new collateral. 
right? And some and sometimes there's nothing there is nothing for that that week or for multiple weeks or have you. But in this in the in the situation when there is something, that's the place that we make sure to hammer on that. Okay, here's here's this thing right here. Let's everybody go through this and um, and like use the new functionality together. Go ahead and you know jump into your demo instance and set a goal, or let's go ahead and manipulate this this new metric together. And and then oh by the way, here's this new slide. You see how it here it is in the in the deck right here. Oh, and it got updated in this implementation doc over here. Just making sure that there's a place where that ends up. That, like there's a recurring place for that to live, such that it actually happens. Because if it doesn't, if there's like not a place for it to live, you know you'll just you'll just forget about it and and then now you're missing out on the opportunity of all that great engineering work and product work or in this case of like an acquisition yeah you know substantial economic investment for instance um cool so we had a great um question that came in here from kellen so i'm going to go ahead and pull him up here and i think this will be fun because we'll have the there's a a, a later stage we could have the early stage impact answer What's up, Kellen? Hey, uh, early stage, early stage impact answer, maybe early stage atrium answer, and later stage um, impact answer. So, Kellen, can you just uh, favor uh, introduce yourself, your company, kind of like what you guys, what you guys do, and kind of the rough parameters of your sales motion, and then we can get into your your question. Yeah. So, I work for Compass. I'm the founding account exec, and we are a three year old company. Um, we have an ASP of anywhere between fifteen to one hundred k. Um, we usually close in like three to six months and we are focused on venture backed tech companies over 200 in headcount. So that's kind of our ICP. Um, I mean, okay. we've, we've wiggled around and, and looked into some other markets, but that's for the most part, our mainstay. Um, and yeah, we are focusing on ways to provide objective ROI information just because mm -hmm. that's a great sales enablement tool. Um, and we, we've been doing a lot of brainstorming and we haven't, We've come up with we've come up with some ideas, but we're we're still in the process of figuring out ways to really iron out something that will hook people in. So, right, and you guys are really early. And if I recall correctly, you guys do um, uh, competition benchmarking and leveling software. Is that my remembering that right? Close, okay. close. Yeah, I suppose I missed that part. We are a compensation analytics software platform. So we take all of your comp and total rewards data and we analyze and manage it for you. And then we also mm -hmm. help you streamline the comp cycle process. So yeah, you were, yeah, you were, you were close to that one, but I, I know, I know Bethany. Um, yeah. and, yeah. and obviously my, I'm, I'm media, my, my pitch, my compass pitch is mediocre as compared to yours, which is, you know, uh, <laughs> hell on wheels. Um, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, wonderful. So, so Marilyn, I guess this kind of is like the, this correlates to our early adopter versus like later adopter, what have you good way for early stage startups who are maybe earlier in that journey, good ways of like delineating ROI. Yeah. So gosh, without knowing more specifics about your business too, it's like all I, I have are, are questions. Right. Um, just like a basic, Ask how do you save these clients money? Yeah. Or so I'll, I'll put it to you like this. So our, 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 the main feature that our customers love is our comp cycle tool. And it is the quintessential, we are going to save you time and get you out of a spreadsheet solution. Um, and so what we're doing is anchoring to the amount of time it takes in the industry to complete a comp cycle. Comp cycles are like the raise review process. So when, you know, you have your sales org and the manager is like, Hey, you know, I have this budget from the CFO and I'm going to give Joe this much and I'm going to give Marilyn this much and Jack this much. Um, that process is tedious and mind numbing when it's done in spreadsheets. Um, so our tool allows you to do it in compass um, and it's obviously more secure and, and streamlined. Um, so we are focusing on the time saving benefits um, and we are figuring out ways to anchor to the normal industry standard and, and, and saying something like this, it takes a normal company, you know, when they do it in spreadsheets a month mm -hmm. with compass, it takes, two and a half weeks. And we don't like, we don't have the industry standard and we're like, we're chatting with our current partners and prospective partners about how they go about executing the process. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. So does that answer your question at least a little uh, bit? Yeah, it does. So 
do you ever think that that any company or any team feels like they might be out of a job if if mm. they get you do you think that any, anybody might feel that way like they don't execute and they underperform and then they're axed is that kind or that, of or that they spend so much time doing this that if they get your software they don't even know how they would spend their time and question whether or not they're needed oh so you're, you're saying replace human with software yeah yeah I, I'm, I'm more just curious if you ever like if you ever had that vibe because so so an impact we've heard this before about us because one of the things that sure. we, we automate payments mm -hmm. and we automate commissions so mm -hmm. for companies where their finance team is manually doing this, yeah. we completely automate it. And occasionally, so it's not a lot, um, occasionally people be like, oh, well, that's so-and-so's like job yeah. to, to do that. And how, so if that is something for you, like, I mean, one of the ways that we would respond to it is, you know, I would always say, uh, look, that's not the feedback we get from finance teams. We do not replace headcount in the finance team. What mm. we do is we help them work more efficiently. So typically finance teams are really excited to start using our product because now they can spend their time doing these other things instead of this manual work and you know, you know whatever, but say it anecdotally. Like this is what other companies say. Whenever we show this to a finance team, they actually get really excited um, to make it a bit more storytelling. But then my other question for you is you used a word that really stuck out, like stuck out to me, which is the word secure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we look at your competitors, you are more secure. Mm -hmm. One thing that might be interesting to look at is what is the cost, the potential cost, if there was ever a breach <laughs> or anything that, that mm. right, anything resulting in security, which risk right yeah. so you can use a little bit of fear there i think to have sure. it like what happens if this such confidential comp data is not adequately secure and protected right. how does that impact your business interesting okay yeah because we've looked at we've done it in a bunch of different ways we've cut up like hey you're spend 35k to solve uh 50 million dollar problem because comp is a company's biggest cap expenditure. Um, that's interesting. We can anchor to security and say, okay, no, that makes sense. Um, Cause there's also the security of somebody, let's say, let's say a comp letter that has all the information for somebody and what happened in the last raise review process. That letter was supposed to be sent to somebody in operations, but it was sent to somebody in engineering. And it's like, well, holy <laughs> crap. the reason that happened was because it was a manual process done via a mail merge and you know, shit hit the fan, excuse my language. But um, yeah, I guess I, cause like my end goal is to get numbers. That's really what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to figure out ways to anchor to numbers, you know? For sure. And I think for us, I think right now we don't, we have a little bit of that power, but we need to anchor to more subjective information. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so one thing I might, I just dropped a, a chapter from my book in the, um, in the chat room. And it's the, the chapter on product marketing and sales narratives. And then there's like a sub component in there or a sub chapter in there on quantitative and qualitative proof of a better solution. Cause that's essentially what we're talking about, right. right? It's like, how do we, how do we, how do we prove to somebody that we got a better solution? we got a better mousetrap um, and, and that they're going to like, it's going to be valuable to them. So I think there's a couple of ways you can go about this. One is um, so often the, the way to think about ROI is, is almost like a bundle, which I think with Maryland, there's there. So there's an automation bundle mm -hmm. of it. This is a pain in your ass. And, and, and so like how much does comp, like what is the time associated with comp review on a per human basis? Well, maybe it's once a year and it's maybe it's 30 minutes or an hour per human. Okay, cool. Well, we can put that in a spreadsheet. And we can say, oh, okay, well, let's just type this in here. You've got 150 people and you review compensation uh, two times a year. Boom. This is how much time that comes out of it. We can reduce it by this much. Great. So, that, so that's like a bottoms up argument. And so in those sort of situations, you, like, you, you throw it together in a spreadsheet. Don't be like super aggressive such that someone is like, yeah, your calculations are BS, dog. <laughs> like hit, yeah. hit the bricks, right? Because then you just 
you know, you've eviscerated any of your credibility, but that, but that's just one. And so then you might go to the next one. It's like, Oh, okay. Well, let's, let's think about the potential cost associated with, you know, an error rate. Right. Right. Like, okay. So let, let's say that you're going to go ahead and like you, you potentially have this error. So then maybe there's an increment. I'm thinking about this because I did this with um, uh, Tanner, the founder of Spiff the other day. So they make, um, they make sales performance um, compensation software, right? Mm-hmm. And so there's a couple of things that they do. They, they automate it, which is great because it turns out doing commissions, you, <laughs> and like doing um, compensation review once a year, you do commissions like maybe monthly, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. So the right. more reps you have, it's a huge pain in the ass, right? So like there's automation of that. But then there was an interesting thing he pointed out to me. He's like, no, dude, like that's one component of it. But the other thing that you do is that people will overpay constantly. Yeah. And it's like, really interesting. Like, oh yeah, people will like accidentally overpay on commissions. And like, usually in most states, if you overpay, it's like, it's very difficult to kind of like get the money back. And so then they would like, they layer that in from a, from like an error rate standpoint mm-hmm. in order to say, okay, generally speaking, if you're paying this amount of commission, you're going to have this many errors. And like, that's actual money. Mm-hmm. And then you have another, then you have another layer, which is, oh, okay. Well, what happens if you underpay? Right. And like, what's the, what's the liability? associated with it. And that's kind of what Marilyn was talking about, like the risk component of, and so you can imagine you guys, the situation and, you know, I'm not a huge fan of like fear-based sales, but like they do have, (laughs) they do have teeth. Um, So you can imagine saying like, think about what's happening in our industry right now. There's like all, there's all sorts of gender discrimination, discrimination lawsuits that are happening as a result of, of like unequal, unequal compensation. Well, you know, What's the legal and li- what's the legal liability associated with that? What's the p- potential PR damage mm-hmm. associated with that? And so I think that would just be like again, it's another honestly to just lawsuits. Yeah, again, right? Yeah. Like looking at benchmarks. I'm sure there's some kind of benchmarks out there too that you can say, you know, on average, you know, within the industry these are the average number of errors when you don't have an automated an automation tool like this Mm -hmm. and here's what that means for your business um and and help you know quantify quantify it that way too okay yeah so what we're talking about is like quantification in the absence of actual quantification which which i I get you man like super hard right so i think what you have to do is you have to do a little bit of jazz hands to start but jazz hands that aren't bullshit right um and then importantly, what you want to do, so actually some of my reps conveniently were like up in my grill about this a couple of months ago. They're like, look, we, we talk a great grain about all this different stuff, but we really got, and like we have super high NPS from our customers and super high renewal rates and, and what have you. Well, we got to have like this collateralized huh, product marketer. Yeah. And, and so what I then did was I went back through and then collected proof data to then correlate with mm. that initial stuff so so a good example of this is i can imagine go like you guys probably do nps uh surveys to your customers and what you can do is you can identify somebody who's like super pumped like a big compass uh advocate Mm -hmm. right and then just do an actual case study with them on all right let's just talk about like how your comp review process used to work and like how your comp yeah how your comp review process worked now with compass and I think the, the funny thing is, is that for all of us, we're like, but that's just like one data point, man. That, right. that isn't like, you know, necessarily like robust ROI across like a huge, you know, data set. Well, yeah, but oftentimes prospects, they just want to see something. Right, right. Some proof. Yeah. yeah. You just need yeah. something to, to validate, right? We all buy, they, people buy emotionally. As long as you get them to want your product. Right. They, will, they will find the justification for it and your jobs to help, right? Give them those tools to justify it. The right. other thing is, so definitely can't have bullshit numbers. Got to be conservative, right? To Pete's point. Um, but the story that you're telling just needs to make sense for them. And even if your number is wrong, I mean, nine times out of 10, they just give you the right number. Now it's different if you say, you know, if you ever wrote to them or asked them, give me these stats about yourself, you might get some pushback, but if you then like take a stab at what you're guessing their metrics are, and also based on certain benchmarks, 
and come up with a rough ROI you know, with all these different things, whether it's security, based on risk, the time that they're going to save, the number of employees they could add without mm -hmm. adding additional headcount right. right, to the team that processes this. So you could say, look, if you buy us, you now have capacity for an additional 50 employees. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's an, another area of saving money. Um, all of a sudden, they just start telling you what those metrics are. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I don't know at what point a young company like Compass has enough enough information to create like white papers and like data and stuff that people can really hook into. Because like one of our main ones is like we're going to save, we're going to help you get out of meetings and reduce the amount of time you're in meetings thus in turn saving you money. So it's like, you know, 40% less meetings over the course of blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and it's like, I think just collecting that information over the course of time and, and maybe after five, six years, we have enough data. We can but do I that. think, but the problem is, is like in the meantime, you're like, yeah, but I got to sell, I got to sell some stuff, some software yeah. right now. Right. So it's like, don't let better be the enemy of good enough. Mm -hmm. So in this case, it's kind of like, look, you start with, you start with the stuff that's jazz hands. Right, like let's build our ROI model, automation, right? So it's like the automation reduction, the, uh, um, the liability reduction, right? The, like whatever it is and, and check it out in that um, product marketing chapter. Sure. So yeah. build that yourself and then, and then go and then say, okay, we have this model and then go to some of your existing customers and be like, hey guys, um, we, wanna, we wanna prove these stuff, these, these things. And yeah, I get it. It's not gonna be like statistically valid or whatever and like, Marilyn, the, the st statistician, uh, you know, 10 years ago would like essentially poo poo on this, but like, guess what? We're, we're just making something that is like directionally defensible. And even if it's just a couple of different slides, then like you're way better than where you were, right. where, where you were before. Yeah. Right? You can't get any existing customer to go on paper and they're like, I, no, I don't want you to use my logo. Or I think like, I don't want to share this level of information. I mean, you can always think about just anonymized case studies and say, oh, yeah. so and so a company in this in this vertical, here's what they saw. You right. know, and start um, telling those those stories even on your own. And really, I mean, unless you're divulging information that makes it obvious who they are, yeah. then, then you're you're you should you know you're safe to to do that. Yeah, definitely. And I and I found that. Um, that a customer reference call is super helpful when we're late stage, you know, it's just like that. That's like, that's just down to the brass tacks and that's what we've been anchoring to. And it's worked. And I think it will always work, you know, that human connection and actually hearing it from another company uh, synonymous to the one that we're trying to sell to. But um, no, all that was super helpful. Um, I think it, I think, you know, it helps reinforce what we're doing. And then also that security, that security and kind of breach cost was, was big time. And then just kind of like line iting, line iteming, stuff like like you mentioned peter is super helpful yeah. too so well, one of it one additional thing i might think about is when you're talking so yes live references are all well and good so do that you know care and feeding for your references every time they do a reference for you you know kick them a hundred dollar uber eats gift card yeah. or you know amazon gift card make sure they're feeling stoked about it etc the other thing you can do too is just record them just just essentially do a uh like a canonical platonic yeah. reference call where literally you just let's hop on zoom together and i'm going to ask you you know my various questions that that a, a reference would would ask you and yeah like the production value will be pretty janky because it's it's like zoom as opposed to you know some some beautiful like hype uh you know customer reference hype video or whatever but guess what as Marilyn points out a lot of people are like people want to buy compass because they want to have like just um, they want to have like, they want to have equality and like, you know, just compensation, mm -hmm. um, policies in their organization that that's like the emotional reason why they want to buy. But in order to prove to the CFO, they at least need this. They need some semblance of, yeah. And by the way, it's going to reduce this amount of time, by the way, it's going to reduce us like getting our ass handed to us in like TechCrunch. by the way, it's going to reduce this, this loss here right here. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Valid. I get it. And of course, now now they now that customer can buy, but the reason why they wanted to buy from the get go is they wanted to have, you know, equitable, just compensation policies. Yeah. So even, like MVP stuff. And um, 
but I know that we're at the end, but one more thing, right? It all also ties back to, right? That typical pain, the pain, right? right. And really make them feel that pain, right? And I've heard other people describe it as drag them through the glass, right? In your right. first few calls, right? Like get them to feel the pain of their current situation so that then, you know, the, the positive business outcomes that are gonna come from your solution are then so obvious to them that they're like, you know what, Kellen, help me, help me sell this internally, help me get it. Yeah, definitely. Well, Marilyn, Pete, I really appreciate it. Super helpful. Um, big fan of what's going on here, and uh, I'll for sure, I'll sure, for sure be here next week. So, really appreciate it. All right, bye, Thank Kellen. You. Say hi to Bethany for me, okay? Will do. Take care. Okay, bye. Um, wonderful. I think we went a little ham on that last question. We did. We did. We, that was like we talked about that for like. 18 minutes. So I got, <laughs> Sorry, we got, we got on a, we got on a rant. I, I think uh, the audience has been kind of like light on light on questions today. All right. Wonderful. Well, I think we're, we're up right now because I got to hop on a customer call here with a rep in a second. Um, hopefully he's doing uh, he's doing pre-call planning right now, but um, so thanks everybody for, for attending Marilyn. Thank you for sharing all of your wonderful brain droppings with everyone. Obviously you've been around the block and have a lot to share. So it was really awesome for you to do that. Um, everybody, I'm going to go ahead and upload this to to YouTube. We'll get that out to everybody and pre previous uh, previous attendees. Um, you can subscribe to there. And then um, next week, I forget who we have um, who we have next week. I'm sure it's going to be someone really uh, really rad. Who do we have next week? Ah, next week we've got Will Foley from Splash. He's the head of revenue operations from Splash. They make uh, awesome um, event event software, so that'll be super fun. But otherwise, everyone have a good weekend. Marilyn, thank you very much for, uh, for sharing your expertise and you have a good weekend too, okay? Thank you, Pete. Thanks everyone. Have a good weekend. Thanks.